Good afternoon, everybody. One more time. Good afternoon, everybody. That's amazing. Welcome to our final keynote session of the conference this year. And I hope you have had a terrific experience so far, because I know I have. Uh, I am Patience Malaba, and I have the pleasure and honor of serving as the executive director of the Housing Development Consortium. And I'm here to share a few updates and also introduce our keynote speakers who I know all of you are looking forward to hearing from. It is inspiring to look around this room and see so many of you. It is inspiring to see so many of our HDC members who are here. Because I want to talk a little bit about HDC. HDC represents the collective affordable housing sector united by our shared priorities. We bring together over 200 organizations, all of us working towards a vision of ensuring that all people live with dignity in safe, healthy, and affordable homes. Together, Thank you. Together we share an unwavering commitment. We share an insatiable dedication to this belief. Because we know that when we stand together, when we build together, when we in strong coalitions demand for better action, we will ensure that all people can find a home that feels safe, healthy for them, for their families across the board. Our journey began 36 years ago when organizations recognized that no one organization can solve the housing crisis. No one individual can solve the housing crisis. It takes all of us coming together for greater impact. And we dream big for homes. And we get things done. A round of applause on that. Our work focuses on advocacy at the local level. And we show up at the state level, all united towards this vision of addressing the continued affordable housing crisis. We broke across sector partnerships because we realize the power there is in coming together from different parts of the sector to address the housing crisis. And we convene the affordable housing sector as we continue to evolve, as we continue to collectively inspire each other to co-create effective solutions in this dynamic changing environment. We're making some significant strides. And I could stand here for an hour and talk about some incredible wins we've made, but I know we all have flights to catch in not too long. So I, I want to be sure to just highlight a few. At the state level, we have worked on drafting bills that ensure that we can generate significant resources for affordable housing. And we've partnered with our partners at the state level, the Housing Alliance, in advocating for the Housing Trust Fund. Just last Friday, we adopted our bold advocacy agenda for 2025. We see 2025 as a pivotal year. Many of you were in the state legislative session, and you heard as we go into 2025, the caveat of the budget challenge. But I encourage you to get ready to show up and be sure that 2025 is a year of no excuses, but it is a year where we scale affordable housing solutions across the state, and together we can. A round of applause on that commitment. Regionally, we are working on a vision of revenue sources to invest in housing. 
Because as much as we can talk about the importance of policy change, which is fundamentally critical, the importance of creating new programs, which is fundamentally important, we need to dramatically increase resources to invest in affordable housing in order for us to get out of this crisis. And we have fallen short in doing that over the years. And that is work that we are taking region-wide and working collectively as HDC. We know we can do this. We passed the Seattle housing levy not too long ago, about a billion dollars over seven years for affordable housing. Yes, let's give a round of applause to that. We are also working region-wide on policy change, making sure that the once in a decade opportunity in comprehensive plan updates is not missed, and that work is underway and working towards getting it to the finish line. On the program side, we have reached over 350 people who have uh, graduated from our leadership development programs, bringing a diverse group of people into the affordable housing sector who are ready to take us to the next height, to the next scale, because we know that we need a workforce to continue to address those challenges across the board. And I will underscore that we've seen many of you in the convenings that we've pulled together continuing to ask the big questions, developing knowledge as a sector on how we continue to evolve and address the challenges of housing. Now, I wanna underscore a commitment that we've held and codified as HDC. We are deeply committed to addressing racial inequities. And we are working in our Black Home Initiative Partnership on addressing some of the most persistent wealth gaps that we continue to see and to ensure systemic change. And it was our honor to have led the charge in working on the Covenant Home Ownership Account Bill and getting the bill passed one time and done, creating the first in the nation special purpose credit program that is run by the government agency in our very own Washington State Housing Finance Commission. And today we have, I understand, I'm trying to look for Lisa, more than 39 folks who are now first time home buyers who were historically impacted by racially restrictive covenants. Let's clap on that. <laughs> we have led the nation just last week I was in Boston. Folks are looking to Washington to learn how to replicate this program. And not too long we'll be in New York sharing the lessons. Washington is leading and we continue to have the opportunity to evolve and lead. So we've made some great progress, but we're also at a critical point as the affordable housing sector. We are facing some of the most unprecedented challenges that are keeping many of us up at night. We're facing rising operational costs, increasing pressures, insurance costs that are skyrocketing. And it demands that we protect the progress we've made in making affordable housing a reality for many families and individuals across communities. We're incredibly lucky in this state in that we have public agencies and elected officials who are leaning in and have their hearts in the right place. And it's gonna take all of us stepping into that partnership as we go into this coming year to address what I am framing as unprecedented challenges. And I call on each of you to come in with a solutions frame as we address those challenges. I look around this room and I see palpable energy and determination that reminds me that we can do the critical work of addressing those challenges head on. The progress we've made over the years reminds me that yes, we can. We've been able to overcome and we will 
overcome one more time. Our mission is more than just about providing housing. It's about building hope. It's about creating opportunity for people for whom opportunity would never have been possible. And it's about creating community. And I want to thank you for your relentless hope and commitment to this incredible vision. And with that, a round of applause to each of you. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speakers uh, who are going to be coming up. David Bradley and Nick Federici, who are both leaders in legislative activity and elections. Both Nick and David are very well known to each of you. Uh, but I want to take a minute to remind everyone of these two amazing people we have. Nick is a government uh, a first consultant who is deeply entrenched in Washington state legislative process, uh, and we are honored that he is serving as the MC for today's discussion. David is a regular contributor to Housing Washington. I think I heard earlier that this is David's 15th uh, session where he has offered his valuable insights into Washington, D.C. So we're going to shift frame and hear about national uh, politics and the opportunities there. For more than 30 years, David, the co-founder and CEO of NCAF, has been Washington's leading advocate for low-income programs. In 1981, he helped found the National Community Action Foundation, and as a private nonprofit organization, funded solely by the non-governmental contributions, the organization represents funding and policy interests of the nation's 1,000 community action agencies before Congress and the executive branch. David asked me to lowball the introduction, but I will not. So we are thrilled to welcome David Bradley and Nick Federici. Please join me in welcoming them. Thanks. That goes yeah. Thank you so much, Patience. I'm Nick Federici. Uh, I think this is my 20-something one of these uh, uh, conferences. They keep getting better every year because uh, you all keep getting better every year. As Patience says, I think I've seen uh, Mr. Bradley speak about a, a dozen times. The, the difference in our wardrobe, I think, reflects the difference between that Washington and this Washington. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, but uh, really grateful to have you all here. And again, David uh, provides a huge amount of perspective and, as Patience indicated, has been an amazing advocate and deliverer for the low-income affordable housing community um, across the country and just really inspired and gratified to have him here once again to share his insights, both about politics and policy on the national level. Um, I've heard there's an election coming up. I think I have about a dozen uh, texts on my phone about it asking for money since I came up on stage probably, right? Like many of you. So, um, but uh, David has been for decades at that nexus of working the politics that help good policy and funding happen. And so very grateful to both the work that he's done um, at the national level, um, as well as for continuing to come back and grace us with his wisdom about what's happening in the big picture um, nationally that inevitably uh, sets the frame or trickles down to what happens here in Washington and ultimately deeply affects all of our lives personally as well as professionally. Um, and so, again, just deeply grateful to, to Mr. Bradley for being here um, to once again share things. Um, well, I'm, I'm eager to come back now that I know the dress code. <laughs> so it's just, uh, yeah. Awesome. I mean, you don't even have to get a haircut. I mean, did you see Steve Walker? I mean, so uh, it's all good. We're very laid back here in Washington State. Um, so, uh, sorry, Steve. Uh, More than I thought. <laughs> um, so, I'll start off with the question that everybody is, is, has in mind. What the heck is going to happen on November 5th this year? And um, 
who's going to be our next president and why? So, so sort of the open-ended essay question on the blue book. Um, so. <clears throat> and you wanted to lead off with that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we'll I, just, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. And go, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me first, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me back. I, I always call Cheryl afterwards, and I, I don't think I've been here 15 years, but 12 years or 10 years. I say, you probably don't want me back next year based on my predictions or whatever. I always worry about that. But I, if, I, if I have any strengths, which my wife tells me I don't, but if I, <laughs> if I do, I'm a pretty straight shooter. I happen to be a Democrat. My hero, my mentor, this guy named Sergeant Shriver. And I like the institutions. I like the Senate. I like the House. I have as many Republican friends in Congress or the Senate as I do in the House, which is rare these days. And uh, I stay out of the far right and I stay out of the far left. That leaves me with 2% to work on. No, it actually... <laughs> It, it leaves a, you know, the low 80s to deal with. So I don't hate. Uh, I want the institutions to work. I just want you to know. And I want, I want government to succeed and to be a positive force in people's lives. And what makes it unique, I think, in the last couple of years is that the uh, number of participants in that kind of club is shrinking. It is a city that is very, very difficult to work in these days. And I like, I like Congress, and, and I really do. I like uh, the, the differences between the House and the Senate. I like the employees. I like the members. I just like the institution. But it's very difficult working there. And members are worried about their safety. Uh, good members are retiring, uh, members that you want from both parties. I was stunned when Derek Kilmer announced his retirement. He's a good member. But just as we looked at a Democrat there, Gallagher of, of Wisconsin, who co-chaired that China committee, rising star in the, in the Republican Party. He's the kind of member you want in there. He announced he was you know, a young family, got to spend more time. What, came, what, really announced, what really happened was all the threats on his family. And he decided it's time to get out. So people are not enjoying the environment, they're not enjoying the working. I ask members, if I know them well, I ask them two stupid questions, really childish questions. And you'll, you'll, you'll say, well, why are we listening to Bradley? After I tell you, one, are you happy? And two, are you enjoying your public service? And inevitably, everyone answers they're not happy. They're not happy, and then second, uh, in terms of the public service, most are not satisfied, but most, and this is important for our country, have an optimism that one day things will get better. The other question, this leads into the presidential, so the other questions I've been asking Republicans is if Trump loses, will the Republican Party turn the page on Donald Trump? Are they ready to begin a rebuild you know, of the party? And uh, inevitably, the answer came back, no. Until Tom Cole, a couple of weeks ago, he chairs House Appropriations. I went down with him to Charleston, South Carolina. I asked him that question. He said, Bradley, that's the wrong question. Or David, that's the wrong question. It's the wrong question. The question is, will we still be Trump's party? And the answer he gave me, and this is a guy that you really respect his answers. The answer was, we still will be. So we're in this, we're in this environment that people are looking at at November 5th with unease. You are know, going through the different emotions on Democrats and Republican side that I'll describe to you. Uh, unease about our democracy, unease about the elections, unease about when we're going to return to normalcy in Congress and things get done. Uh, and we get productive again. Well, guess what? 85% of the House has never served in normal times. They don't know what it's like to get legislation done, to work together across party lines. So it's a very, very unusual time right now, unlike any I've ever seen before. And I'm troubled by it. There's a, I'm not going to end this conversation uh, with you this afternoon on a negative note. There's good things coming. There's very good things coming. But till we get to that point, got to pay attention. 
because it's an unusual time. And what we don't want is we don't want the good members in Congress, men and women, Republicans and Democrats, saying it's not worth it. We need them to invest in, and continue. We want their intellect, we want their commitment, we want their passion, and we want their belief in America uh, to, um, to blossom and uh, legislative. Now let me talk about the president, uh, the, that race. First of all, the, the, uh, you know, the, the word on Biden was around for over a year. I was surprised continuously that, that people were not focusing on it. Not that I had any great insight, but I sure had a lot of members, particularly senators that tell me when they would meet with the president, uh, if it wasn't on a note card, he couldn't answer. And, and they were concerned about it. So that was around for quite a while. Um, and the need to replace. Second, starting, I think really when it hit home to me was the Friday before Memorial Day. I had breakfast with uh, Teresa Ledger Fernandez, who's a congresswoman from Albuquerque, a baseball team that we, we were involved with, and then um, Melanie Sansbury, also from New Mexico. And they shared with me polls in New Mexico a blue, blue, blue state, what was going on. And not only was, was Biden almost even, so he'd gone for, I think he carried New Mexico by 14 or 16 points in 2020. He was one or two up, but he was sinking the Senate can, candidate, Martin Heinrich, who was a terrific senator, and possibly sinking two House Democrats. Right after that, Betty McCollum, who's my friend from St. Paul, Minnesota, who's the, the uh, ranking member on defense of probes and somebody that's very important in my life, uh, shared with me Minnesota polls, all related to Biden. Biden was sinking the ticket. And I started hearing that everywhere. Because, hey, I started asking, keeping my eyes open, but it was worse than I thought. So it was sort of inevitable. I felt that Democrats would have to move, get beyond, get beyond um, Biden. Second thing is, this is going to come up a little bit later in a couple of minutes, but second is that, is that it was fascinating to me that Republican lobbyists, these are the big guys and the bad guys, some of them, Republican lobbyists and Republican House members said basically from probably April or May on uh, that they're going to run against Harris. They had made the decision that, that Biden wouldn't be the nominee. And yet Democrats didn't make that decision. They were still convinced that Biden was going was to be the nominee. So you had, you had a lot of dynamics. And every, every Republican in, in the House and Senate had their opinion on who Trump should be his running mate, who he should have. And what surprised me is that probably 80% of the House members had one suggestion. Anybody want to, you can leave early. <laughs> Anybody want to take one guess at who they all thought he should choose? It was not J.D. Vance, let me put it that way. <laughs> Tim Sc no. Tim Scott. Tim Scott. And I was surprised. The first time I met Tim Scott, Chuck Grassley, who's senator from, from Iowa, who's 90 years old. He's only, only going to run for two more terms. Uh, <laughs> Grassley said, you can, I can see him in the White House one day. He'd been in the office like two weeks. I can see him in the White House one day. That's who they wanted. So, so everyone was sort of jockeying around, and then the Democrats were a little bit behind the... Behind the, the uh, the game in terms of what do we do with the president? So looking at that, if um, and then and then the expectation was, you know, if Kamala Harris is the nominee, should be the first Democratic nominee who didn't run in the primaries. The last one uh, since 1968, Hubert Humphrey did not run in the primaries, and the track record of sitting vice presidents being elected president, it's pretty sparse. The last one was George Herbert Walker Bush. And before that, you remember Martin Van Buren. Eight, eight, well, I'm not, I'm not quite that old eight, to remember eight, him. Eight, 18, but, uh, 1836. <laughs> so there's a lot of reasons, well, this you know, might be somebody else. So all that was going on. 
And as it was going on, two things happened, one Republican and one Democrat. On the Democratic side, a wave of pessimism set in. And you, you know they're pessimistic, and you know they're really depressed when they say, well, just wait till 2026. Already wrote off the election. I was hearing that continuously. There must have been a memo somewhere. And on the Republican side, and I ran across this at Amelia Island, which is where it's called Main Street Partnership, where these moderate Republicans meet. It's where I met Dan Newhouse. And I'm a big fan of Dan Newhouse. I think he's a good member. Um, and uh, this was the weekend after, I think the weekend before Memorial Day, because the weekend after it was somebody else I was up in Oregon with. Um, they were all in on Trump. And everyone, all these members, moderate Republicans, I knew, knew what they thought about Donald Trump, had all endorsed him. And they there was a change overnight, change overnight on Democrats, change overnight on Republicans. So Democrats were going to write off 2024, prepare for the worst, prepare for some losses. And members are talking about they're going to leave in 2026. I was hearing just a lot of members that wanted, Democrats that wanted to leave. It's no fun being in the minority. But all of a sudden, there was this burst of enthusiasm among, among Republicans. So I asked them, why? You know, what's the change? The change is going to come back in our story in a couple of minutes. But the change was, uh, if Trump wins the White House, we keep the House and we carry the Senate. There's no ticket splitting. We will be in control. So they're willing to support Donald Trump, even if privately they got deep, deep, deep reservations about him and what he means for the country, because they can retain control in the House and they can grab control in the Senate. So it's been, it's been a absolute tidal wave, back and forth, ebb and flow of Democrats' opposition or, or, or opinions, enthusiasm or concerns, same on the Republican side. So first it was pessimism. After Kamala Harris and the honeymoon, man, happy days are here again. Man, they're, they're singing, we're going to win. Yeah, we can sweep. We can sweep. And you're hearing that repeatedly, even among some pessimists. Uh, on the Republican side, pessimism after uh, Kamala Harris got, got uh, uh, the nomination. Pessimism. Right now, it's changed again. And I don't know what it means. But right now, I'm finding that Democrats uh, are very timid, worried. Uh, I was with, uh, this way, today's Thursday. Monday, I was with Suzanne Bonamici. She's a good member from Oregon, somebody I deal with a lot on, on things I'm involved with. She spent the weekend, three days, campaigning in Michigan. And she came back a little bit surprised at some of the feedback she was getting, particularly in low-income communities. She expected that Kamala, Kamala, Kamala. What she was hearing was what probably we hear a lot is, what's Washington ever done for my family? Hearing anger. So she came back, hmm, not everything is the way I thought it would be. And second, on the Republican side, there is a little bit of momentum right now. They feel that it can't get any worse on what Trump says. You know, we've, done, we've gone through that, and we're still in the fight. You know, he's still standing. And the, is, the issues that, that, that voters care about, the economy, inflation, the border, top three, they identify with her. St state of our liberty and our, our independence and our democracy and, uh, you know, women's health, our other issues, I mean, that there... And by the way, I'll talk about this later. I, I follow cam, uh, campaign ads, which you don't want to do. I mean, that's, that will ruin your personality if you spend any time. It's a little soul-sucking, right? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, but if the wife wants to watch HGTV, I slip off into the library and watch TV commercials. Um, housing's out there. Members are starting to campaign on housing issues. When Zenke campaigns in Montana, on housing issues, or Ken Calvert in, in Los Angeles, who chairs def, uh, defense approach. You know it's starting to sink, sink in. So Republicans feel, we've survived the worst, we're still standing. And the other issue that Democrats are starting to raise is they wish 
Kamala Harris would be a little more specific on what she wants to do. So you hear moderate, you hear newscasters talk about it, she doesn't do many interviews, but syncing in with Democratic elected officials, at least at the, at the federal level. So we're going through a period that is, is 40 days. Who knows what's going to happen? So here's my prediction. My prediction is, is that Harris wins 270 to 268. I spent the weekend going through every poll that I get. I get reasonable. I don't get the outliers I'm looking at that. I think Harris wins. What I'm worried about is I'm worried about foreign interference a week before the election. They had a briefing, top secret briefing yesterday uh, in, in, the, in Congress. And members have been hinting at it for a few weeks, uh, and it's bad. And then you're worried about, about post-election. If there's recounts, if there's you know, anger, if there's election was stolen. I'm not worried, I was in, in those of you that remember, I was worried about January 2021. I think I talked about it out here. Uh, I'm, DC's gonna be different this time, and they're ready. And I, I mentioned to some people earlier, I, I, I talked, I, I like the Capitol Hill Police. Uh, um, they're, the men and women are really terrific people. And I'm a big dog person, I, particularly labs. A lot of them walk outside with their black labs. But I talked to one about his January 5th, 5th and 6th experience. And I tell you, it was, uh, it'll never leave my mind what he went through. And uh, being told on the 5th to update their wills because they thought they were gonna die. And his partner did die. And uh, what he went through. They're going to be better prepared this time, but it's around the country that some mischief may happen and, and disinformation and lawsuits and delays. So I think the period a week or so before the election until probably around January 20th is going to be very, very uh, pay attention. Pay attention. But I think Harris wins, uh, assuming 40 days out there isn't anything unexpected, which is... Uh, Pretty uh, unsafe assumption because this is an unexpected campaign. Uh, Donald Trump has made, he's got the A team on his campaign. And um, you know, in 17, they weren't prepared to govern. Everybody knew it. Got three weeks into the administration and uh, I remember thinking, we can beat these guys. They don't have their act together. They don't know how to govern in Congress. Yeah, this is amateur hour. Uh, and, and his campaign was amateur hour. A lot of the people on that campaign, privately, some of them I know, thought, we're not going to win. Evidently, Melania didn't think they'd win. She's still pissed about it, I think. The, uh, <laughs> but she'll sell you an autobiography, right, the, uh, or a Bible. The, uh, um, the, the, other, the other thing, though, is that Trump has the, an A, a team on his campaign. This time he really does. So these are professionals, and he, I think he got the best and the brightest, most of them, on the Republican side. He made four unforced errors that I was surprised at. Uh, number number one is that um, he pushed to have a debate early. That was Trump doing that. Just think if that debate were in September, uh, where we would be at. Yeah, that would have been game over. Second, and and, you know, and it's and I'm not, you know, I'm not anti-Trump. I'm not and, pro. And you, and you mean the the debate with Biden? No. Uh, well, yes, yes, that debate. But uh, the second point is is that uh, on on the convention, if he had stayed on script that last 45 minutes, it might have been game over. I mean, he had he had the country. They're seeing a different. They wanted, they wanted Donald Trump. They have good memories of the economy. Their memories of, of Trump are the good things about Trump. And that's that uh, family in Detroit. What's Washington ever done? At least Trump is perceived as standing up for him. He didn't do it. Third is J.D. Vance. Um, that was, uh, I personally, uh, thought Rubio would be better, but they couldn't agree on Ukraine. And you can work out the, the uh, residency because Cheney lived in Texas when 
George W. Bush ran, and Cheney ended up switching his voting registration back to Wyoming. They could have handled that. But Rubio is ready. J.D. Vance is not. So that was number three. And number four was what I said earlier, and that is they were f caught flat-footed about Kamala Harris. And, and just that she would be the cat. That surprised me. But as of right now, I think it's going to be incredibly close. Obviously, everybody does. Uh, possibly the closest election we'll ever see in our lifetime. But if the election were today, um, Harris wins. And I think Walls, Betty McCollum deserves the credit for Walls. She called me a month before, said that she was going to, he's governor of Minnesota. She's a very powerful congresswoman. That was her, her mission, to get Walls on the ticket. And the polling on him is through the roof in terms of middle America, Midwest. Uh, he's just a regular guy. And that's, uh, so it's a pretty strong ticket. Now, Senate and the House. I think the Senate flips. Uh, West Virginia is and it's controlled 51-49 by, by Democrats. It, uh, I think, obviously, West Virginia is gone. Jim Justice, uh, the, the governor, is a lot like Donald Trump. He really is. I happen to deal with him on a banking issue, and he's a lot like Donald Trump. But he wins that seat. Tester's gone in Montana. And Democrats privately are saying, well, we're going to lose Montana. Tester is a terrific guy. Uh, he's, uh, he's an unusual guy. If you've ever seen him, he's got a flat top. He's lost three fingers from a farming accident. He's nine. He's also the biggest senator I've ever dealt with. And I went to Big Sky with him a couple of years ago, and uh, we did some town halls. And, and he had breakfast, and I always had my oatmeal, Snoqualmie, by the way, which I've heard they've discontinued. I can't get it. I used to have an oatmeal club of Harry Reid, John Kerry, Tom Harkin, David Joyce is still in, Susan Davis. We share a love of Snoqualmie oatmeal. Um, we'll see if we can get you a local hookup. Uh, and yeah, it's nutty, it's microwavable, mm, it's great. Harry Reid. Uh, anyway, Tester, I estimate Tester had 8,000 calories at breakfast. <laughs> Three hours later, he saw me in the hall. We were at this big sky thing. We were doing a couple of things. And he saw me and said, David, they're going to serve lunch. And I'm still full from breakfast. And I said, and he said, guess what they're having for lunch? And I have no idea. Prime rib. Oh, man. Just, you know, just, you know, just <laughs> straight in your veins. He's going to lose. Then it becomes Ohio. Uh, Sherrod Brown's the last guy standing, last Democrat statewide standing. That's tough. Uh, Trump's got a double-digit lead in there. So there's three right there. That gets you 52-48. Um, and then a couple other races, a couple of sleeper races to point out. Casey's about eight up. I question that number. He's the incumbent Democrat in, in Pennsylvania. I question that. But I think Casey wins. Michigan is one to keep an eye on. It's close. And that's the Stabenow seat that's uh, vacant. I think Baldwin wins in, in Wisconsin. I think Rosen wins in Nevada. Uh, people will talk Kristen Cinema seat in Arizona. That's Carrie Lake running for that. And you get emails from Carrie Lake, uh, dead even, need your money. Don't do it. Uh, and uh, Republicans, National uh, Republican uh, Senate Committee, which is their campaign, uh, has pulled out of Arizona. Gallego will win the cinema seat. But there's two sleeper ra races I want you to look at, and then two that Democrats are focused on. All those are Republican uh, opportunities that I just described. Uh, the Democratic uh, opportunities, they're going after, before, well, I'll go through the sleeper, uh, I'll go through the Democratic opportunities and the sleeper races. Uh, Florida, Rick Scott. He's uh, <clears throat> got more money than God. But he's never won a race by less than by more than one point. And he's got a spirited Democrat on there. This is Florida. This is Rick DeSantis. But that race is surprisingly close, and, and Democratic Senate campaign committee is investing some money. I'm not optimistic there. But the other one's Texas. Ted Cruz and Colin Allred. Uh, they're basically tied a little bit uh, uh, out close to the margin of error for for Cruz. But Allred's not the issue. The issue is Cruz. Nobody likes Ted Cruz. I didn't realize it. Even Mrs. Cruz, it appears. I don't. Um, and that's a that's a, that's a tough race. Demo those are the two opportunities for Democrats that they're 
they're focusing on. If I had to predict, no, and I'll deny it after I leave here, it's uh, Democrats don't win either one, but they're going after those. Two sleeper races. One is not too far from here. It's Nebraska. And it's Deb Fisher versus a fellow by the name of Osborne, who's sort of a, a, a unusual Democrat. He's pro-gun, uh, anti-immigration, sort of a hard edge to him, dead even with Deb Fisher. That race is off the national radar screen. I was just talking to some people over the weekend from Nebraska about what's, what's going on in their state and starting to see a lot of ads. So that's a Democratic opportunity. Uh, the Republican opportunity is uh, Maryland. Maryland, Biden won by, 30, I think, 30 points. But, uh, but uh, Ben Cardin is retiring. You've got uh, Larry Hogan, the former Republican governor. I dealt with him on baseball issues. He's terrific. And the, uh, uh, the Democrat has a few problems. Angela also Brooks. It's dead, dead even. House side right now, if the election were today, uh, I can tell you that Republicans would win 211 seats. Republican, or Republicans win 211, Democrats will win 205. That means that 19 seats are in play. If you split the 19, which would be 10-9, follow that math? Okay, 10-9. If you give Republicans nine, they're at 220. If you give Republicans 10, they're at 221. Um, that's if the election were today. But just since I spent time on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on this, um, there's two seats in Iowa that are now in play. So my prediction is that the Democrats win the House, but by two or three. So look, at the end of the day, look at, at the prediction. And that is a narrow presidency with undoubtedly people questioning the results. A narrowly divided Senate, 51, 52, and a narrowly divided House. My mentor, as I, as I said, or it was said, my mentor is Sergeant Shriver, and that's what sort of guides me in life. If you look at 1965, I didn't know him in the 60s, but if you look at Shriver, uh, Lyndon Johnson, 1965, people talk about the great 89th Congress, that 65, 66 Congress, what they were able to accomplish. You know, and just, you know, the Civil Rights Bill, just the Economic Opportunity Act, just aid to education. HUD was established in 1965. You look at all of this and, think, man, what was different? Well, what was different is Democrats had 68 Senate seats, Republicans had 32. In the House, Democrats had 295 seats, Republicans had 140. Now, it could be flipped. I'm not, I'm not arguing for Democrats to get super majorities. The point that I'm making is legislating is very difficult. And I don't think it's going to get any easier. So I think Harris, if I'm right on the predictions, and who knows, but uh, if I'm right on predictions, Harris is going to have trouble on cabinet selections. She's going to have trouble on, uh, on budgets, uh, on, on bills that she sends up. She's going to have a difficult time. And Democrats... Uh, if they control the House, two or three predictions. Number one, Hakeem Jeffries is one of the winners. He's done a very good job. Now, I'll point out two winners, one Democrat, one Republican. That will surprise you. I think have had very good years in Congress. Uh, uh, and the majority party ro uh, runs the House. But just as we watch the Freedom Caucus put demands on McCarthy, or McCann, uh, demands on Johnson, you may have the Progressive Caucus that fell into line to support the Democratic agenda. Hakeem Jeffries and, and Pelosi is very, very active on the Democratic agenda. She is, she's really been remarkable. Just that so they've fallen in line, they can easily fall out. So a narrow margin gives any particular grouping of members extraordinary power. So it's, it, Although the majority party runs everything, it still ain't going to be easy. Uh, final one. This is a long answer to your question. I apologize. I'm still here, just in case you get forgotten. Uh, long answer to your question. Uh, winners. This may surprise you. Uh, 
I've looked at what, what Democrat do I think really changed their perception, was a winner this year. You may be surprised at this. To me, it was Ocasio-Cortez. She's kept her passion. She's kept her fire. She's now a team player. She's very active on housing legislation with Tina Smith, and I met with her and, and uh, Smith recently, and I'll talk about that later. I've been sort of asked to help on strategy. They're drafting me rather than me saying, here I am. Um, but she's, this is not the Ocasio-Cortez we saw a few years ago. And Ken Calvert, I mentioned earlier, uh, Republican California, and tough reelect, by the way, uh, chairs defense appropriations, helps me on things on the community services side. And he always says to me, David, I'll help you, but if you have any member of the squad, I'm out. I had Democrats tell me the same thing. Now, Democrats praise Ocasio-Cortez. The, the winner on the Republican side, Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan. He's a team player. He has raised a lot of money. He's been in 260-some campaign appearances. Members have taken a different approach to, to Jim Jordan. And if indeed Republicans, there's a price to, for Johnson to pay as speaker for the failed CR strategy, for how, how it angered, and Jim Jordan will, you know, third time might be the charm. Jim Jordan is in a stronger position than I would have imagined uh, two years ago. So there is a short answer to your, to your first question. I hope that was informative for you or whatever. Okay. At least three of you. Okay, good enough. Question Project number 20. two. No. Um, I sent him 10 questions ahead of time. I think he blew through the first six with one uh, seamless answer. That's, that was really impressive. Um, so we talked about politics. We I mean, one of the things I found most interesting that we hadn't talked about was the role of Nebraska. Um, and folks may have seen earlier this week the, you know, Nebraska splits up its electoral votes by congressional district, and the Trump campaign was pushing to change that and have it be traditional winner takes all in the electoral college. And one, and the Democrats are huge minority in the, in the Nebraska legislature, in the unicameral Nebraska legislature, but they have enough to mount a filibuster to keep the electoral college system uh, from changing. And so if, as you indicate, uh, hypothetically, 270 to 268, all it would take is that one, there's one electoral vote in Omaha, right, that goes Democratic uh, relatively regularly. And so if they changed, if they had changed, now, now there's three Republicans that will, will not vote to, to overturn the filibuster in the Nebraska legislature. Um, that could be literally the margin of victory for Harris, is that one uh, congressional district electoral vote in Nebraska. Uh, you know, I don't think any of us had that on our bingo card for what, coming into the 2024 election, which has been so fluid and unpredictable. You but also that's have a, Maine. And Maine. And Maine does it by electoral district as well. Absolutely. It's um, interesting. On, on Nebraska, the, the Republican, I happen to favor on re-elect. That's Don Bacon. Bacon's a good, yeah. a good member and fights the Freedom Caucus, Republican, fights the Freedom Caucus, and you know, he's, he's, I think, a very good legislator. Um, so we so we talked a lot. Of, yeah. So we've talked a lot about the politics of this, right? What do you think we can expect? You know, we'll talk about both sides. We know a little bit more about Harris and probably some continuity with Biden policies and, and Biden administration, predict, predictably. Trump Project 2025, which he has disavowed, and yet his entire <laughs> former campaign staff wrote it. Whatever. Um, um, if uh, if Trump gets elected. Project 2025 is the blueprint, uh, theoretically, for a uh, second Trump administration. What do you expect out of that? What's he said? What does that blueprint say? Um, and who's pushing the buttons um, in, a, in a second Trump administration? Beats. Another short and sweet question. Beats me. I don't know. What's the <laughs> next one? Here's, here's the thing on, the, on Project 2025. Um, Washington knows about it. The country is just waking up to it, but boy, it's been on Washington's radar screen for quite a while. And so I want to start, I'll give shorter answers, I promise. Um, I want to start sort of big things to, for you to consider and watch and then drill down on what it means for us. This is the Heritage Foundation's 
grab at being the major policy influencer for conservative Republicans. It used to be American Enterprise Institute, Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, and probably a, a bunch of others. They were what sort of fueled intellectually the Republican establishment. Heritage, by design, has made a conscious decision probably six or seven or eight years ago to be at this moment. They want to be the uh, intellectual stimulant and intellectual experience um, or provider to conservative Republicans. And they want conservative Republicans. They'd rather not have a Republican than a moderate or liberal Republican. So the document is her heritage saying, we're it. We're the big guys. And we're the ones to listen to. So you know that. And you know, they built a dormitory. They bring in lobbyists or interns. I mean, they are absolutely trying to dominate Washington. It's number one. Number, number two, uh, Trump may not have read it. And, he, and my bet is he didn't. It's boring as hell. <laughs> it's uh, 920 pages. It's predictable. Uh, and it's scary. But here's a couple of things I want you to look at. And I, was, and I, and I, I got up at 3 this morning because I'm worried about my flight back to uh, uh, D.C. through Atlanta. Everybody so pray I mean, for a light hurricane avoiding Atlanta. Um, so that, uh, but I wrote down a, a quote. And I, it's got to be Steve Bannon, I, from memory. Uh, basically, that's in there. Basically, saying we'll have uh, a peaceful second revolution if the left allows us, which is a threat. So this is a, a in a lot of ways, is a call to arms. Now, on the HUD portion in there. Uh, it was written by Ben Carson. Anybody remember Ben Carson? Anybody have good memories about Ben Carson? If you don't remember him, this is true. He sells a memory pill. You can, you can, he does. He sells a memory pill that makes you a genius, supposedly, according to the advertising. He was HUD secretary under Trump. Uh, here's the takeaway on that. There's no very few specifics in there except most of the senior staff would be made political. Devolution to states and localities, which is a mantra that they have throughout government. And, and, and questioning HUD programs that perpetuate uh, generational poverty. That's the big takeaway. So I'll put them down as not convinced HUD is necessary, right? But in terms of Project 2025, uh, here's the game plan as I understand it. And right before August recess, I got a chance to talk to a controversial Republican who happens to be a friend of mine, and boy, do I pay a price. But uh, Elise Stefanik is, is, has been a friend since 2015. Those of you in community action here know that she's been very, very helpful to me. So I got a chance to talk to her about Project 2025. They're going to try to move it through reconciliation. Reconciliation is a speedy environment that gets you around the 60 vote threshold in the Senate. Uh, I wrote the Community Services Block Grant in 1981 because reconciliation gave us Graham Latta that, uh, that brought into law uh, the Reagan Revolution. So it is, a, it is a tool to advance an agenda that is not necessarily popular. We also have the Affordable Care Act through it, uh, reconciliation. So, so number one, they're going to do it on a speedy thing. Two, their time frame is 100 days and 180 days. They think they can, they can encapsulate, in, uh, encapsulate all the changes they want in 180 days. Most presidents, presidencies are viewed by their activities in the first 100 days. That started with FDR. Uh, but they're saying, well, it might take us six months. So 100 and 180 days, they have a plan. But here's the thing that, that people haven't focused on. All the committees in the House that are run by Republicans, they control it, are up to speed on this. They all have plans on what they're going to do. And the biggest, biggest thing that, that I would be worried about at HUD is devolution to states 
and localities. In other words, ship it, uh, maybe even provide no money, turn it over to the states, turn it over to the private sector, if that makes sense, but we're out of the business. That's number one. I don't see that as, as pervasive on HUD as it is on other programs. And second, cut. Absolutely cut funding. I mean, uh, scorched earth pro uh, process, which is going to get into the third question on CR. So it is a serious document. The public is just waking up to it, and the polling is showing that, that what they hear about it, they don't like. Democrats are late at the game on messaging. Some Republican candidates are saying, that's BS, I'm not going to pay any attention to it. But I am skeptical of how much Republicans are going to fight Donald Trump. And uh, I've relied on, in the past, Two Republicans in 81, Weicker and Stafford, two senators, fought their party to help get my CSBG in law. Two Republicans, Mark Hatfield and Chuck Grassley, stood up 1985 to everybody, including the Reagan White House. Nine Republicans and myself uh, turned Newt Gingrich in 96 into the largest domestic increase of a program that they wanted to eliminate, number one. I don't think two or nine or five or whatever are going to work this time. And what Cole told me in, in uh, Charleston, he said, make sure you're in the Trump budget. And what that implied to me is, we're not going to fight Trump on this. We're all in this together. The more successful he is, the more we're going to keep power. So the budget fights that are likely to occur are really going to be brutal. And if all this scenario, which, I, which I'm not predicting is going to happen in terms of Trump and, and, and Republicans control everything, but the real fight's going to be on spending, which leads to the CR. Aren't you glad you're up here? I am. <laughs> um, leads to I'm just your arm candy. 10 minutes, 15. Am I talking too long? No. no? You're literally covering everything I that we talked about, so it's all no, good. Two, two people are awake. OK. Um, <laughs> continuing resolution. Um, Johnson made a mistake. And when, when Johnson proposed six months and the SAFE Act, um, he had not consulted with uh, that Speaker Johnson in the House. That was his first CR. He hadn't consulted with appropriators. And the appropriators, the Republican appropriators I deal with are the guys who have been around forever. Tom Cole, who's full committee chair and a terrific guy. We share a love of books. I'm part of his cigar group. Uh, I don't think he eats oatmeal, but... Uh, He's a good, he's a really, really good, Democrats would vote for him for be Speaker. Hal Rogers has been in since 1980. David Joyce from the from, uh, uh, state of Ohio, a big Cleveland Guardians fan if you follow baseball. Steve Womack, who chairs uh, THUD, good member. Um, Mike Simpson, Idaho. These are, these are good, good, Ken Calvert once in a while. These are good Republicans. They were upset that Johnson had not consulted them about the... Um, continuing resolution. They thought it was a wasted, wasted time to go through all this machinations. Why, why uh, mark, uh, march members out on a plank, have them take a tough vote for something that's going to die? So members were upset, and they were upset at Johnson. That's number one. Freedom Caucus, our Heritage Foundation, pushed that six-month CR. They wanted it. And they were forcing members on that. So what I'm anxious to see is, has that dented their armor at all? Has that changed members' perception and support for them? But the CR that went down should have, that he had to pull back. The one that passed should have until December 20th and keeps everything pretty much in place. So that means that Congress, in their, in their wisdom, has punted again. And we're in for a wild November and December. I think November will be chaotic for other reasons, but December will be a lot of negotiations. Republican uh, fundraisers, uh, Republican donors are pushing. If Trump wins, they're saying, don't settle, don't settle uh, pro uh, 25 appropriations in December. Wait till we control the White House. Then we're going to slash and burn. That's when we'll launch Project 2025. Others are saying, we want whatever, who's ever president, they ought to have a clean slate to start with. Why come in and the first thing you got to deal with is possible government shutdown? I happen to agree with that. 
but it's going to be wild. And you still have the Freedom Caucus. You still have the Republican Study Group, which is about 70 percent of the House, wanting to make cuts. And the hang-up on all of this is Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden on the debt ceiling had a handshake. Never wrote it down. And the handshake was for 2025, we're going to, we're going to increase defense and domestic by 1 percent over current levels. Let's shake on it. They never wrote it down. Everyone knows about it. But Republicans are saying, the House are saying, Freedom Caucus particularly, it's not written down, it's not law, we're not going to honor it. And the Senate did honor that. That's the difference on appropes. What it means on HUD appropriations is there's a $7 billion difference between the House appropriations bill on HUD programs and the Senate appropriations bill. What I think will end up is they'll go a little bit more than split the difference toward the, toward the Senate side. But that is, that's the fight, and then you've got all the policy writers. But hopefully after the election, the policy writers will be less important. So we just have a few more minutes, so I'm going to make myself a little useful here. Um, uh, uh, we're seeing a lot of partisan polarization, um, as you indicate, depending on maybe regardless of what the, what the, what the results are of this election, it's going to be close. It's going to be passionate. It's going to be tightly contested, and a lot of a lot of feelings, right? Um, both rhetorical and threats of violence, as you say. There's been intimidation. There's the the potential for foreign, you know, interference in our elections. Um, how do we get out of this mess of conflict, grievance, polarization, uh, people pointing at each other or pointing other fingers at each other? Um, how, how do we get out of that? And what can we, we do collectively, both as people and as professionals, to help support a path forward? Again, regardless of who wins, but particularly if that's the level of acrimony um, that we see socially in November, uh, to your point, how do we help collectively and individually lead the way to a better place? Back to normalcy, to use your term. Well, the, uh, and I've got three or four minutes. Ten? Good. Got time for one answer then, right? We haven't really had that. No. Um, a few years ago, I went to a Senate Republican retreat, and it was down at some island, St. Simons or something off of Georgia, Brunswick and take a bridge. And they had 300 lobbyists there and 30 Republican senators. And as one who's involved with low-income programs, I stick out, believe me, at Republican <laughs> events. But they were, they were really sort of courting me, honestly, and I'm not, that's not a Bradley egotistical question. They really were. And so at dinner that night, 10 lobbyists had uh, dinner with one senator. Well, they gave me McConnell, which was the big deal. So it was McConnell, Elaine Chow's wife, and then lobbyists around the table. McConnell took the high road. He really did. And the McConnell I dealt with on a lot of issues always, you know, I actually like uh, uh, Mitch McConnell. He's been very good to me. He's been a man of his, his word on everything. Uh, and then Elaine Child spoke. She brought it down six notches. But then the lobbyist spoke. And I, I was very, very short because I didn't. McConnell knew a little, little bit of me, but he knew everyone else very well. Then the guy across from me, next to McConnell, represented coal, tobacco, and distilled spirits. So everything that could kill you, he represented. He took it to the absolute below the basement in terms of partisanship. And then Elaine Child jumped in. Unbelievable. So that dinner, I started listening to the rhetoric from lobbyists to Democrats and Republicans. And they're fueling this. Democratic lobbyists are telling Democratic members what they want to think and hear about how bad the other side is. So lobbyists play a role in this, number one. Number two, Chuck Grassley, uh, two things. Chuck Grassley told me that uh, he gets asked probably 100 times a week for help. He said, David, I hear uh, people tell me thank you maybe twice a month. They're, they're never thanked for their work, and it's tough work. And I asked Dan Newis, I don't know if I said this earlier because I've been speaking for an hour and a half here. Um, I had uh, breakfast with Newhouse right after Kathy McMorris. Did I tell you that story here? Did I tell you guys that story? No, no I didn't. Because I've told that story like seven times today. I had breakfast with uh, Dan Newhouse right after Kathy McMorris announced her retirement, and he was undecided about running. 
And I asked, uh, I asked Dan, I said, what would you convince you to run? And he said, if I felt I was appreciated. And that stuck with me. And he felt that he goes through a lot, and he's a hard worker. Newhouse is a good member. He's also, him and Derek Kilmer are all your only two House members on appropriations. And he said, I just don't feel that anyone appreciates what I go through. So the opening to me is, say thanks, be the good guys. Say thanks, thanks for your service. Even if you disagree with them on a vote, just thank you for being there. That's number one. Number two, when they, when they help you out, or if they do something, make sure that you're, you're, you're visible in thanking them. Uh, they want to be thanked, they want to be appreciated. Third, um, you know, I may give you my opinions, which I obviously have, um, but in members' offices, I know, with Elise Stefanik, who's you know, big on Trump and all that, I've never talked presidential politics with her. There's so many other good things to talk about. There is a real opening to raise the dialogue in this country. There's a real opening to, to help bring civility back. And what is hard to impart, it's my failure you know, of not being able to do this successfully with you, but what is hard to explain is how anxious members are for times to get normal or get better. So my, my, my ending on this, and then we can take one or two questions, my ending on this is I think that, that there is a very, very, very good chance, despite the drama that is ensuing, despite the closeness of what is uh, you know, between the House and Democrats and Republicans in both House and Senate that I think is likely to happen. I think there's a time, there, there's, a, there's a chance to really make a difference and, and there's a core of people that if they're supported politically, which is my job, but if they're thanked and appreciated in their districts and they're not attacked, uh, I think that there's a, a really good possibility of building a coalition out from the middle. And I mean this, this is not my uh, ending comment, so you feel good and say, oh, yeah, Bradley wasn't as bad as we thought it'd be. Uh, it's this, housing's a bipartisan issue. It really is. And, and not every issue, believe me, is bipartisan. Uh, and I'm involved with issues that, that I gotta navigate a very thin line on between Republican and Democrats. But there are over 1,000 bills introduced this Congress in the House and 1,000 bills, a little bit over that in the, in the Senate. You look at the players, who's talked about it, who's interested in it, there's a chance to really do some positive things. You may not get everything you want, but you can move the ball down the road. And I think members want to do that. And if they do, if you identify champions, and with this change in Congress, there's, there's going to be some new champions that emerge. Make sure that you thank them. Make sure that they know you recognize their leadership on this. And, and, um, and the other thing I would say, the other thing I didn't mention, I talked about Heritage Foundation. Uh, Center for American Progress is trying to be the same voice and influencer on the Democratic side. If Harris gets in, if she's elected president, former HUD Secretary Castro's on their board I'd be looking at Castro to HUD, to uh, the Harris uh, White House quite a bit uh, in, in terms of that influence. And the other one that, that has very few enemies, and that you always look at, very few enemies, is Tina Smith of Minnesota, who wants to be active on housing issues. So there's a better day that's out there once we get through uh, six to eight weeks of, that will make us want to take a shower and sleep for a long time, but, but we'll get through it. So until we have time for one question, and thanks to folks who submitted their questions through the Horton Hears a Whova app. Um, uh, we're only gonna have time for one, my apologies. Regarding uh, Vice President Harris's campaign promise of delivering three million affordable houses, what is the plan for the delivery of those houses, and how would she make that happen? I'm skeptical that it can be pulled off, to let you know, number one. Two, with, with um, 35 trillion national debt, two trillion on, on uh, annual deficits, uh, money's 
how you pay for it's going to be a big issue. What people haven't focused on is the House Republican rules that Steve Scalise put into place. Sunsets every, every program in seven years, number one. People don't, people don't realize it. They want to do the same thing in 2025. And second, how do you pay for it? It used to be is a good policy. Now the first question anybody asks you is, where's the money coming from? With her, I'd ask, where's the money coming from on that? Uh, because things that she wants to do require Congress. And, and so until there's more specificity, I am skeptical that some of that can happen. But one other thing, if Harris is elected her HUD nominee, and you know, we've got an acting HUD secretary now, but her HUD nominee, if you guys want a question or two questions, ask of the HUD nominee at Senate confirmation hearings. If you send them to me, I will take some responsibility for getting the mask. Okay? It's everything I know. Please join me in uh, thanking David Bradley for his brilliance and, uh, and wit in joining us today. Let's get David Bradley another round of applause. I've been blessed in the years I've been coming to this conference and hearing him every year, and he is the highlight to me of this conference. He gives an amazing presentation of what he knows, the ultimate insider. Before I get too much further, I want to thank the people who put this conference on. I've had many people tell me this is the best one they've ever been to. Uh, we have a contactor by the name of Cheryl Engstrom and her wonderful team, including Marty, um, Castillo and Catherine Filippini. They do a lot of work that you don't see. All these things you see on the board here, I never see those till the day I get here because they take care of all that. They make this show really run for us. And this year we recognize the first year we've ever had a sellout in advance. And that is a tremendous response to people who care about housing. Okay. Well, before we end this year's con conference, let's take a minute to look at the screen for a sneak peek at next year's conference. Bellevue, Washington encompasses the beauty and restorative power of the outdoors, the anticipation and excitement of world-changing ideas, the sensory exploration of fashion, art, and culturally inspired cuisine. We are a premier destination built by futurists, rooted in the spirit of the Pacific Northwest. Placing every visitor on the verge of creativity, innovation, and style, where the allure of aspiration touches everyone we meet. For a global audience seeking a collection of elevated experiences, bring yourself to the edge. Bellevue, Washington. Welcome to the edge. That's going to be an awesome venue for us next year. And what you just saw was a brief look at the conference location for 2025, the Hyatt Regency in Bellevue. It is the first time we've held housing in Washington at a large hotel. So we're very excited about all the possibilities for a fresh new experience. Let me quickly highlight and share a few important components of next year's event before I tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the Alliance. Registration will open on February 1st of 2025, much earlier than in the past. So please register immediately. We encourage you to mark your calendars and register early because we don't want you to miss a spot at the conference. This year we had a couple other people who couldn't get in. That's a lot of people who could be helping us out. The call for proposals is now available for Housing Washington website. The beautiful sessions you saw, that came from you, the audience. So that will open up pretty soon on our website. So be looking out for that. This is your chance to tell us about what you want to learn next year. We read every one of these proposals, and there are a lot of them. We read them all. And they're due to us on February 1st, 2025. You'll be getting reminders throughout the fall and winter until that time comes up. Also, sponsorships available to us and exhibit opportunities. So they'll be available to you now. So if you're looking for, to be involved, please speak with Catherine Filippini, 
if you're a sponsor, to make sure you get your spot for next year. We hope you enjoyed the last two days of the, of, with your colleagues, listening in on the sessions with our industry experts, browsing our mini exhibits, and taking part in special events, including the tours, reception, Friend of Housing Awards, and of course, last night's karaoke. <laughs> Remember to say the date, September 28th through 30th for Housing Washington 25. Now we're starting on a Sunday, which is unusual. That's the day where people are traveling, so we're gonna make that day a light day of getting to meet people and enjoying each other, but the real meat of the matter will begin on that Monday morning. So please make your, your travel on that Sunday, come out and relax, and enjoy that first day, and then we'll get to busy that next morning. Again, remember to send your session proposals to us early so we can get those looked at. It's now it's time to get the review for them in February. And if you're considering supporting next year's event, we encourage you again to secure your spot early, especially if you want to secure an exhibit space. We have limited space for that. And with that, we thank our sponsors who really have ponied up this year. We gave over 40 scholarships to people. That's getting them here, housing them, and paying their conference registration. Those sponsors are very important to making this happen. Uh, I hope you have a health, safe trip home, be safe, and look forward to seeing us next day doing all the work to make our state such a, place, a great place to live and a place where people in the future have an opportunity at the tree of life here in our great state of Washington. Good day. <laughs>